Welcome everyone from wherever you are joining us from. I am here today with two of the very right reverends. On my right, Reverend Michael Wardrop. On my left, Reverend Andrew Hogarth. Andy is my senior pastor. Mike is the people's pastor. <laughs> the pastor of the people. The pastor of the peoples. And we have been colleagues in ministry for many, many years. Today, we want to equip you with um, some language and some theology that's going to help you navigate what we would call woke theology and how that impacts your discipleship as a follower of Christ, what that means for leadership within the church and leadership by example outside of the church. What do I mean by woke theology? Well, we'll get into it um, as we go on. However, but what we're seeing just by way of context, is more and more this insidious creep of feelings dictating truth and us wanting to find a God or a church that always agrees with us. Mm -hmm. So we believe that, you know, the one true God will vote the same way that we vote, will hold the same values as we do. And anytime our experience doesn't line up with that, well, then we've got to find a church or a paradigm or a small G God to worship that agrees with everything that we think, feel or experience in life. So we're not trying to be flippant about how people's experience and their reality has shaped the way that they relate to the world. But we as Christians, we as followers of Christ, we as the church, big C, the church, who have been entrusted with the great command and the great commission, we who have been entrusted with being ambassadors for Christ, we must understand this so that we can serve our culture with love and humility. So we're going to get into it in a very real way today. So we would just love your grace and for you to receive this conversation in the manner intended, which is that we are absolutely humble, we are absolutely willing to learn, but we are absolutely determined to equip the body of Christ, the church, with the understanding, information and strategies required to grow the church to build disciples who make disciples right now and today. So, welcome you guys. I Thank love you, you so much. Thank Always you, a pleasure. So, to be here. <laughs> if we're going to talk about woke theology as a sort of, we're not, um, we're not revising doctrine, but we're revising meaning. Does that sit with you? So it's not that we're changing what the Bible says, we're changing the way we interpret what the Bible says. Yes, and I mean, even before that, I think, Mike, you had a really good definition or working definition with woke theology sure. and what we're really dealing with. Yeah, 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 if that's helpful, yeah. So I was, I was sort of workshopping this before and I thought, okay, woke theology is effectively a 21st century theological position, right? We didn't call it this before the 21st century. That advocates for the elevation of people on the margins of racial, social, economic and political spaces. It's an overarching... T so that's the most generous version of so it. So what you're saying then is that woke theology makes room for those who have traditionally been on the periphery, on the margins, or in a minority? Yes, yes. So that's, that's I think, where it begins in a generous space to go. The intent is to take people who are on the margins, who have been marginalised, yep. uh, whether deliberately or, or unintentionally, and elevates them towards the centre. Um, that's the most generous part of it. But then we get into it a bit more. It's the overarching term for a politically liberal, deconstructionist theological position that believes systemic injustices are stopping human development. And it sort of comes from this legitimate need to... This is written down, so I can just read it again. It comes from the legitimate need to wake up to social issues of race and gender and inequality in the contemporary West. And it sort of comes out of the 1960s liberation theology and then... Handball back to Andy, not just from 1960s liberation theology, though. Yeah, and I, I think I think that it's a really important thing for people who are very progressive in that. Mm -hmm. I use that in that broad in a, sense. In a theological or political or sphere, you a mean. bit both, yep. and also conservative to understand because we can yeah. attribute wokeness, um, or or the woke exp um, understanding 
beyond what it was originally intended. So even from mm-hmm. the 1880s, right, uh, the 1880s, so I'm talking the end of the mm-hmm. 19th century. So we're talking about slavery, end of slavery. Yeah, right through to the 1960s, um, both the African Christian experience and the African American Christian experience was uh, you, the, the idea of wokeness really came from that. And it was the sense of they they were seeking an identity beyond what uh, the dominant at that stage white or colonial mm-hmm. powers were. So, And it was very legitimate, uh, well, quite obviously, you know, black is beautiful sort of thing. Understanding that, claiming that, and claiming... Claiming the, you know, really the um, authentic uh, anointing and apostolic um, calling upon them as groups of people, um, which had previously been sort of literally whitewashed, mm. you know, over. Yeah. So, so, what, what... The, the, so that that was a really that's a really significant thing. And part of the it's sort of when we're talking woke. There's woke and then wokeness. So I think what we're going to be addressing mainly today is wokeness, which is sort of a an expanded but also diluted and in some ways, in some examples, maybe a hijacked mm. um, version of that very yeah. significant experience. And so I, I wouldn't want... I, I, I think I, I would really want to say... You know, for both uh, Indigenous Australians, Indigenous people across the world, uh, African American and African Christian, um, and and I think now you know the the largely Asian Christian experience. You know, in the twenty forty window across the middle of the globe, for them, very very significant, um, and they were the original woke, and and that mm. long may that continue. Yeah. Uh, because that is a so, really significant thing. But what we're dealing with is sort of a, a Western... Yeah. So historically, what if I've understood you correctly, Andy, historically what you're saying is wokeness came out of largely from the African-American experience across the board, essentially where it's just like our identity and the issues affecting our people group matter yeah. and we're not going to allow them to be defined or attributed value or otherwise by somebody outside of us. So when you hear the phrase, we've got to stay woke, mm-hmm. it's we've got to stay really sharp on the ways in which a dominant culture will make smaller or diminish our experience, our agency, et cetera. Have I understood that correctly? Yeah, and particularly where that dominant culture, where there's streams of racism. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. Essentially that. Uh, that is absolutely yeah. And so following on from that, what we're saying, that when we're talking about sort of wokeness, it's like we've kind of appropriated or culture has appropriated a lot of the good intent from that movement or from that reality in order to justify a set of beliefs that is more progressive, deconstructionist Mm -hmm. and designed to elevate what was previously in the margins. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. Okay, so if we now want to define some terms. So, Mike, you used a lot of big words. Thank you. And you're very smart and attractive and we love that about you. Went to an inner city private school. Thank you for acknowledging (laughs) it. Um, could you please use your white male privilege to mansplain to us the terms? I'll take wow. it from here. Yeah, I'll take it from here. Thank you. So I'd like you to talk about... Um, so, Andy... No, I'll start with you, Andy. Okay. You mentioned progressive. Yeah. Define your term. Yeah. I, I think for the sake of this conversation, I think by progressive I mean... Um, in its most extreme form, the deconstruction of almost all that is, all that has happened since the 1600s through to 1980 and the deconstruction of that in order to basically create a brave new world at the expense of that, of all that has gone before. And that's a key thing. Very good. So, Mike, Mm -hmm. if you're talking about it's a deconstructionist Mm -hmm. kind of worldview, Mm -hmm. so just... Piggybacking from what Andy shared there, just break that down for us. Deconstruct, yeah. deconstructionist. <laughs> yes, thank you. Let me break that down. Um, d- that's what deconstruction is. It's, it's deconstructing, breaking down something that currently exists. So the, I think the predominant form we see is organisationally. There's been a movement, particularly in the last 
30 years, but really the last 70, to say we cannot trust organisations. Whereas you get to a point in, you know, the mid-20th century where if an organisation says it, it is true, now it's the complete opposite. We've gone through royal commissions for aged care, for uh, obviously for uh, religious practitioners. Uh, What's that on the banking sector? We're, we're having these massive commissions into effectively deconstructing the problems within. Now, those are healthy things, but what they have then engendered within us is this idea that we cannot trust anything systemic I mean, it's kind of like you, you can't trust the man so work it out yourself now in a sense i sympathize with that I'm like mm. yes please think for yourself but there's another sense that in that it is so naive for us to go we are deconstructing organizations and systems and we're not being reconstructed by other organizations and systems and networks that we don't realize about so we have no idea the degree to which other organizations are infiltrating us and communicating their morals and values and virtues through us. I mean, and the most, the obvious big four, uh, Apple, Amazon, um, Google, and Facebook. You know, people who go, I don't want my information stored. Like, what do you mean you don't want it stored? It's gone. Your information is <laughs> gone. See ya. So you can deconstruct organisations all you like. Yeah. like. This is why Mark Zuckerberg can sip water in a, you know, in a hearing as calm as you like because it's already done. He's yeah. already communicating. Yeah. And, and and we were having a conversation quite recently yeah. where, where you were sort of railing against the deconstruction that you're seeing in the church and in mm -hmm. discipleship. Mm -hmm. Because we were talking, and Andy, I know you'll resonate with this, is that we get so frustrated that you'll deconstruct everything. You can't trust this. You can't believe that. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible didn't really say this. Let me tell you what Paul really meant. Yeah. And in its place becomes this almost idolatry of self. Well, what I think and what my experience is and what I want is, is, is superseding... Um, millennia's worth of biblical scholarship mm -hmm. and orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah. orthodoxy. Another big word. Yeah, Let's define point. that term in a minute. So any thoughts around that? Yeah, you've got to trust something. And the idea that we trust ourselves, again, is, um, is, is quite naive. We should love ourselves as God loves us. But the idea that we trust ourselves is anti-biblical. You know, the human it, heart is deceitful. Above all things. Above all things. That's exactly right. And so... But, it, but also, it's also inconsistent to yeah. do that because it's like we don't do that with um, our money on the whole. Like on the whole, most people when it comes down to massive wealth mm -hmm. will trust people who have dealt with 30,000 cases of that. Or let's, let's do a personal reason. It's like the person who says, I don't go to therapy. Mm -hmm. They've got their own therapy going on which is their friend next door or... I counselled myself. Or whatever. I counselled myself. Um, versus going to see a psychologist who has, who has studied 30,000 cases yeah. similar to yours. Yeah. So which one do you want to do? And that's an argument people have. When we come to open heart surgery, <laughs> yes. it becomes even more ridiculous because we quite simply do not trust ourselves. What we trust is someone who has done 30,000 cases yeah. of that and we trust them with our literal heart. So we're not even consistent when we say, hey, don't trust the man, mm -hmm. man, you know, because when it actually comes to very practical things, 100%. Um, we drive over a bridge that has been designed by someone who, again, has studied 30,000 cases of bridge building versus yeah. me. That's right. So it's like a misplaced sovereignty almost. It's like I am my own ecosystem. And so are you calling out a sort of a degree of, is it, would you say it's hypocrisy or naivety or indulgence? Uh, look, it's probably a little bit of all that. And it's not that, it, like, to use the heart surgeon thing, people, a lot of, you know, Quite obviously, no one in their right mind is going to say we shouldn't trust the heart surgeon. But what they will do is they will question whether that heart surgeon and three or four other heart surgeons have kind of one of them's made a mistake and they're all covering for each other mm -hmm. um, with a whole heap of medical speak that uh, actually excuses them from one of them who has done malpractice. That's what people have an issue with. Right, and fair enough. Right. Because that's not you, about the 30,000 cases. That's about a misuse of power. Which yeah. leads you, and I'm, I'm about to joke, but also not really, to the mindset of what if they're putting a chip in your heart so that Bill Gates can access you and control you via 5G? You know, that, that leads you down that line. Yeah. One extreme yeah. pushes mm. against another. Yeah. 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 
So I think what we, uh, what I'm noticing here is that a lot of the way that I suppose wokeness and woke theology has started has actually come from a noble place. Mm -hmm. So the deconstruction of organisations and the royal commissions, they're designed to break down what was yeah. in order to rebuild something that makes it better, more equitable and ultimately safer. They're, they're addressing safer. sin. Seriously. They're addressing yeah. sin. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So it's like, it's, it actually really matters. It matters that people on the margins, yes. people who have been marginalised, um, that they are, because that 100%. matters to Jesus so, 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 so much. And so we're not sitting here saying, throw it out. We're not trying to chuck out the baby with the bathwater. But I think sometimes what wokeness does is chuck out the baby with the bathwater because we're just yeah. like, throw it all out, find a God and a church that agrees with everything you say and go about your life where God doesn't bother you with anything like, hey, please don't do yeah. that because it's not what I want for you. And you're yeah. like, <laughs> and what would you know? I think it's probably helpful at this point to talk about progressivism and conservatism Great. because they're such loaded terms politically and we are largely talking about them from a theological perspective. Yes. And the, one of the points that's really helpful to know is that progressive and conservative are both good words. They are yeah. helpful words. Yeah. Conserve to preserve something that is of value. Progress to move forward into the new pl into a new place, into Good. even the kingdom of God, That's if right. you will. That's so right. we can get into a problem when we when we say progressive and people say yes, progressive political parties. Like, well, that's, that's actually not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a progressive interpretation of Scripture, a conservative interpretation of Scripture, and the ways that each of them can hold value but also have uh, yeah. significant problems as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, really important. So I think here what we're hearing, so liberation theology was a reaction to sort of post-colonial, so colonial meaning nations that were colonised mm -hmm. by another party. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Portugal, for example, Australia, for example, America, um, you know. And particularly the African experience. Particularly the African South experience, America, slavery, South America, all of that, huge, huge, huge. And so you've got a bunch of people who are going, not anymore. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go ahead with this and we're going to put language and we're going to build a culture yeah. that is for freedom. Right? And it started from a noble place. And then you've got orthodoxy. And so it's a little bit more, I wouldn't say licentious, but certainly liber liber libertarian. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I think we need to appreciate that. Yeah, and it, when, you've, you, when you've been... Oppressed. When you've been on the margins, um, whatever those margins are, um, you know... You've got nowhere to go. Mm. Yeah. So the only way to go is forward. And yes. if that means burning down the place yeah. or burning down a mm. few places, breaking a few eggs to make the omelette, yeah. you will do that yeah. because you're driven by yeah. um, you, your back is to the wall. Yeah. Um, and so whenever people's backs are to the wall, yeah. you know, we're only we're only two meal two missed meals away from a revolution. Yeah. You know? Um, well, that's and it's an interesting thing when you think about a revolution. Like when you talk about terrorism, you talk about Palestine, Israel, Gaza, all of that mess. Mm. Um, you know, you, anytime there's an oppressed minority, you're going to create revolutionaries, and they're going to have backs against the wall, and they've got nothing to lose. And that's yeah. why it becomes dangerous. Always so, be a really important that we've defined those terms. I want to move forward a little bit now. Can we now quickly talk about orthodoxy? So, you're going to hear us talk about orthodoxy a lot today because, uh, but orthodoxy in a positive way. So, I think sometimes when we hear words like conservative, orthodox, traditional, we can kind of recoil and go, ugh, stale, yeah. white male <clears throat> privilege, oppressive out of touch, judgy, etc. But we actually want to understand our terms here. So if we're talking about orthodoxy, Andy, what are we talking about? Yeah, so we are talking about, and caveat being, uh, just about every movement tries to make claim to orthodoxy, <laughs> even if they're not, you yeah. know. But orthodoxy is, I would say, an understanding of the core truth of all of Scripture, Old and New Testament, read in the light of the New Testament, read in the light of Jesus Christ, understood and applied by the Holy Spirit into that context, in the, in the context also of the broad revelation of God through Scripture in Jesus Christ. Astounding. Okay. Mike, can you put that in plain language for us? Orthodoxy is right thinking. There it is. So, no, but Andy, your point is beautifully articulated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it's 
understanding the whole of Scripture in its appropriate context through the finished work of the cross by Jesus Christ to enable us to think correctly about issues that matter to God. Yeah, and I would say to think and act correctly. So there's things that we would look at that people would say, oh, that's progressive. Well, it was orthodox. It all depends on the context. Mm. So um, Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the context of the uh, Nazi war machine or political machine, um, they were orthodox down to their bootlaces, but how they acted was progressive, Mm. Uh, particularly uh, Bonhoeffer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who and and Karl Barth wrestled with some of that, yeah, uh, because he said, "Hang on, are you, you know, there, there was this conversation: should I be part of a plot to end Hitler?" That's yes. a very progressive approach. Yes, um, uh, Bonhoeffer, so, one of the few theological heroes of the progressive and conservative churches. Oh, everyone! Well, everyone makes claim of him, yes. partly because he died in his early late thirties, early forties. Yeah, uh, so he, or like yeah. that. theologically, he was never he never had the opportunity to fully mature all of his thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, another example: Methodism, uh, the seven in the seventeen hundreds, mm-hmm. uh, affected people like Wilberforce, like progressive reformers. Yeah. Who reformed the slave trade? Yeah, England, and yep. did that quite radically. Yes, I mean in comparative yes. terms. Yes. So yeah. you, you've you, you've got so it's not just right thinking; it is a right action. Yes. Love it. But the right action is controversial because mm-hmm. sometimes you're going, yeah, yeah. So. Right. So right action is orthopraxy, right? Let's add another fancy word: Ooh. orthodoxy, orthopraxy. Yeah. Sounds like I'm having a medical consult. You sure are. I'll give you the bill later. Um. And the problem is we're separating them. There's a, there's a group that is out there and they would largely label themselves progressive that says, yes, right acting, let's do it. What about the thinking? We will backfill that later and we'll try and find a way that the scripture fits into that. Then there is another group that I would say are more conservative that would say, yes, right thinking. What about right acting? We'll get to that if we have time, but it's important that we understand all of this before we do any of that. And mm. both of those are extremes that don't hold both yeah. right thinking and right yeah. acting together in tension. It's and I think for the, those playing at home, I think that is a very helpful little litmus test. You know, a litmus test is like the little thing they use in science to dip. And if it changes a certain colour, you know it's the right substance. Yeah. Yeah. If it doesn't, you know it's not. Yes. So always check what is what are people, what is the thinking going on here? Mm. And what is the practice going on here as a whole? Because what it will reveal is whether or not you are fitting your theology to your experience or whether you're submitting your experience of life to the Bible, to theology, the way you understand God in Scripture. 